morning, Life Point. How's everybody doing this morning? Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Let's put those hands together and let's worship the one who is worthy. Amen. You are here as we lift you up. You are riding on our brains.
Jesus. How many of you know that when God calls you out to do something that he's always going to be with you, that we're not going to do that alone, that he goes before us and prepares. And I'm just so glad that we serve a God who cares that much about us, that he will never leave us alone. So we thank you, Lord.
us know that you're closer than a brother. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. And I will call upon your name. And keep a minute to just thank him because no matter what we've done no matter what we're going through he can wash it all away
Amen. Come on, put those hands together if you believe it this morning. In a day and time where many churches are abandoning the message of the blood, I think we need to run back to it. Amen. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. How many are thankful for the blood this morning that was shed for us? that not only saved us, but delivered us, that not only delivered us, but healed us, amen, that not only healed us, but gives us victory, not only today, but tomorrow and forevermore. So, Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the victory on the cross, Father. We thank you, Lord, that he's seated at your right hand. We thank you, Lord, that we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, today we declare and we decree, Lord, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. The enemy cannot cross the bloodline. We apply the blood to our family. We apply the blood to our homes. We apply the blood to our finances, Lord. We apply the blood to every aspect and every area of our life, Father. And just like just like in Egypt, Lord, when the death angel saw the blood, he had to pass over. And when the enemy sees the blood, he has to pass over. He cannot touch us, Father. And for that, Lord, we give you praise. And for that, Lord, we give you glory. And for that, one more time, Lord, we celebrate you in this house. Come on, if you're thankful for the blood. Praise the Lord, church. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hey, do me, a, do me a favor as the house lights come up a little bit. Just turn around and shake two or three hands and welcome each other here this morning. Come on, just welcome each other here. God bless you. It's good to see each and every one of you. for some good news? Uh, let me ask again. How many are ready for some good news? Anybody ready for some good news? All right, I'm going to share some good news with you. We just, uh, at the latter part of this week, received permission to occupy our new facility. Amen. And so we are going in. Our offices are going to be moving over there, and our um, groups will be meeting there. That's the good news. You ready for the bad news? Okay, here it is. Um, we really need to make this happen fast. So we're looking at a two-week window, okay? So, yeah, that's what I said, too. But anyhow... Um, at the beginning of October, we will have our offices and be ready to meet our groups there. So this Saturday from 10 until 4, we are having a church work day. There's work that needs to be done on the inside. There's work that needs to be done on the outside to help get that ready. So the more hands we have, the better off we're going to be. And I know we're not going to knock it out in one day, but if we can get started with that, and we're going to be calling on some people throughout the week to help us. There is a sign-up sheet at Life 
Life Point Central on your way out. If you can just help us out with that by signing up and saying, I can commit an hour, two hours, eight hours, whatever it might be, 30 minutes, I don't care. Just if you can commit some time to be there, be greatly appreciative. And uh, this is some good news, amen? This is some news we've been waiting for for a long time. And uh, we are working with, again, architects and developers right now for some different phases coming. Let's just get in there right now with, like I said, our office and our groups, and then we'll start talking about assembly. We'll start talking about us moving over as a congregation. Got a little ways to go there, but hold on. We're going to get there, right? We're closer today than we were yesterday, and we praise God for that. So our ushers are coming, and we're going to receive God's tithe and offering this morning. And because of your faithfulness, we are able to do what we're doing and continue to grow. I believe that God is positioning us and placing us to make a difference, not just in individual lives where we build one life at a time, but I also believe that God is positioning us to have an impact in our community. And I'm telling you, God's going to do it through us, and we're, the best is still yet to come. It's your faithfulness in your giving that enables us to do what we do. So I'm going to pray, and the ushers are going to ush. And then there's a video that's going to play. How many had a great time at the tailgate party last week? Anybody? Listen, if you didn't make it, oh, my goodness, we had such an awesome, awesome day. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I'm going to pray they're going to show a video, and then I'll be right back. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for moving. Lord, we thank you for making ways when there seems to be no way. We know, Father that it's not our time, but it's your time, and you're always on time. And we give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everyone said amen. Let's watch the screen. As long as you have a touch of water on that marriage, it can blossom again. As long as you have a touch of water on your family, it can blossom again. As long as you have a touch of water on that business, it can blossom again. Why? Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the
How many of you believe that this morning? It's never too late. Amen. Never too late for a comeback. Anybody know what I'm talking about right here? All right. I, I seem to have that preaching finger going in that video a lot. So that's that prophet pointing. Da 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 da. All right. Hey, like they said, 125 group, 125 people signed up for groups, and uh, that's awesome. Some of you have already met this past week, and we encourage you to get connected. That's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to develop uh, your in your relationship with Christ. Iron sharpens iron, and getting together with other people of like faith is going to help you. Um, Barb Brenninger, Barb and Tom have a group, and they're doing a Bible study, Choosing to Change. And uh, Barb and Tom are right here and to my left. Wave at us, guys, back here. And I would encourage you, if you want an in-depth, good, solid, Bible-based group to get involved in, get involved in their group. Barb and Tom will be able to help you afterwards. This is the book you guys are using. Am I right about that, Barb? Thank you. Um, is this mine or you just let me look at it? It's mine. Thank you so much. I, I received that. All right. Praise God. <laughs> You're going to have to help me. Remember this. The more you say amen, the faster this whole thing works. There you go. That's how that works. All right. Am I forgetting anything? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Let's get into the word. So, Father, I thank you once again for the opportunity to receive your word today. I pray, God, that we would not only be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word. Faith without works is dead. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, meaning, God, that you would give us understanding, insight that will help us build this foundation in which we stand upon, the foundation of faith. We'll never cease to give you the praise nor the glory. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. I really got, uh, I felt a really heavy um, teaching, mantle, anointing in the first service this morning. And um, so I'm not sure how this will go in the second service. By the way, did, did you guys like all of us being together last week? Wasn't that awesome? Come on, was, the house was packed and just a great energy in the place. And so anyway, so Pastor, why are you having two services? Anyway, this, this thing I want to talk to you about today is I want to talk to you about all in. Everyone say all in. So I began this series last week by encouraging people to get back in the game. And, you know, for some people, it was just, you know, they have stepped outside of their faith and had been, you know, really not connected with the Father and walking in their relationship and growing in their relationship. And just the opportunity to reconnect with the Father, get back in this thing called faith and this thing that we walk out every single day of our life. And uh, understanding no matter where we've been, what we've done, as long as Jesus is in the story, there's always room for a comeback, right? There's always room for a comeback as Jesus is in the story. And so, you know, that doesn't necessarily just have to equate to my faith and, and recommitting my heart to the Lord. You can have a comeback in any area of your life. I don't care what it is financially. I don't care, you know, maybe you failed at a business and God says, try again. Uh, maybe some relationships that are going south and God said, you know, try again. So I'm just letting you know, we serve a God who's able to take that which is dead and bring it back to life. Is there anything too hard for God, right? There's nothing impossible with him. So it's never too late for a comeback. And really, that is the first step to becoming all in. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about becoming all in. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to share with you what that looks like as a LifePoint team member. And I'm going to say, take a look at what that looks like as, as we grow and develop our spiritual faith. Now, in America, this term, all in, it began really with a slang expression meaning in a bad spot, meaning exhausted, worn out, or spent. That's what it used to mean. How many have been all in? A couple of times, a couple of places, right? Some of us have been there. Stay with me. It gets better, I promise. And then when the 90s came around and into the early 2000s, there was this game that came out called Texas Hold'em. Anybody ever hear of that game? Some of you? Okay, a couple of you. Any players? Let me see. No, never mind. Anyhow. Um, so the phrase all in 
took on a whole different meaning. And it meant, you know, someone who was actually playing the game cards and, and they pushed their chips to the center of the table and they're like, this is everything. I'm all in. Win or lose, I'm betting it all right now. By the way, I'm not endorsing gambling, okay? I'm just telling you this is where... Okay, all right. But today it has a little bit of a different meaning to it, and it really means something like these lines. It means that um, it means that I am enthusiastic. It means that I'm passionate. It means that I am um, fully committed. It means that I'm devoted. It means that I am dedicated. It means that if, if I say I'm all in, what I'm saying is you can count on me. I'm in. You can count on me to do this. I'm in, okay? And so all in is fully devoted, dedicated, and committed, but we have a passion that goes with it, right? So I want to talk about what that looks like today, and I want to start off by asking you, asking you this question, and that is this. How many of you have ever said something like this? Lord, I'm never going to do that Again, let me see your hands. Anybody? Come on, audience participation. Lord, I'm never going to do that again. All right? Boy, those hands went up and down really quick. Now, let me ask you a follow-up question to that. How many of you did it again? All right, all right. Ready for the second question? How many of you have ever said, Lord, I really mean it this time. I'm never going to do that again. I really, really mean it. Let me see your hands. Okay, put them back down. How many of you did it again? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. We've all been there. We've all done that. We've all said it, maybe some more than others, but we've all been there. We've all said that. This is what the Bible says. The Bible calls that a stronghold. Everyone say stronghold. The Bible calls that a stronghold. Paul talks about this stronghold in Corinthians. He said, you know, Casting down imaginations and every thought, bringing it into captivity of Christ and pulling down strongholds. And really, really what a stronghold basically means, it's a fortress. It's like a prison. It's like being, in a, being uh, imprisoned. And so people develop strongholds in their life where they become ensnared and imprisoned to certain things that always seem to trip them up and to set them back. It seems like, you know, I can take two steps forward and then all of a sudden this thing just begins to resurface in my life and it pulls me back and it, took, it just, I lose ground every time this thing seems to resurface in my life. That's a stronghold. And many times people just come to the place where they said, you know what, I'm just going to accept that this is just part of life. And you begin to say to yourself, you know, it's never going to get any better. I'm never going to change. This is the way that I'm going to be. This is the way that it's always going to be. And you just accept it. This is just one area of my life that I just can't seem to get victory over. And I thought about that and, 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 and I understand this and I understand it more today than I ever have. And I understand the fact that you can be saved. You can love Jesus. You can accept him as your Lord and Savior and still not be free. Now, I know that's kind of been taboo in the church because, you know, we, we don't want people to think that we struggle. We don't want people to think that we have some issues in our lives. We don't want, you know, I got saved and everything's taken care of. Well, yeah, our sins are forgiven. They've been washed in the blood of Jesus. But some of us still have some issues that we're dealing with that we still need some victory over. Can I get an amen in the place today? Amen. There's some areas in our life that we seem to struggle with. We're not free uh, totally yet. And so there, there are fortified areas in our life that hold people hostage. They just hold us back. And it really keeps us from being all in. It robs us of our joy. It hinders our commitment. It hinders our dedication and our surrender to the Lord. And so we're going to talk about how we get over these things, how we, how we move beyond uh, these strongholds in our life. Because how many of you know God just doesn't want you saved? God wants you free. I said he doesn't just want you saved. He wants you free. And so 
I'll just take last week, for instance, because it's fresh in our minds. There were people who responded to the altar call who said, you know what? I'm saved. I, I want to recommit my life. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to reconnect back to the Father. And they came back. We talked about the comeback. They came back. And so, and that's fine for a while. And that's good. I understand all of that. But how many of you know that when the dust clears and everything settles, there's still a battle going on. There's still a fight that takes place. Um, I'll say it this way. Once the tailgate party's over, right? I mean, everything was fine. Everything was good. I mean, the energy was so high in this place last week, and God was moving, and God was touching lives. But how many of you know that once all of that settles down, we have to walk this thing out by faith? I mean, we, we just have to, we have to apply the principles and the precepts that God's word teaches us, and we have to continue to walk this thing out by faith. I want you to look at Galatians 5 and 1 with me, being saved and being free. This is what it says. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Don't go back. And do not let yourself, here it is, be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In other words, once you commit, once you take that step of, of, of coming forward and acknowledging and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he says you need to stand firm in that place. You need to stand firm in your faith. He said don't allow yourself to go back to that yoke of slavery again, which lets me know that I can be saved and I can still be struggling with some area in my life, that if I don't get victory over it, I'll, I will become a slave to it. Hmm. So let's just say that one of you wanted to pull me aside today after the message and you wanted to ask me this question. Pastor, wh uh, why do you think God wants me to be free. And, you know, I did that kind of pastoral look and, you know, if I had the gold tea, I would just kind of stroke it and I was like, well, you know, I really think that God wants you to be free for freedom. And you'd be like looking at me like, what? Is, is that the best you got? Is that the only understanding? Is that the only revelation you have on this particular scripture and this particular topic, uh, you know, and you might be saying, well, maybe I just need to find me a new pastor because this guy don't get it. But I want you to look at something. If that was the case, then why is this in the word? And the reason that this is in the word about not going back and the reason that, that it's, that it's in the word is because it's not obvious. It's not obvious that I can be saved and then go back into slavery. It's not that obvious. And so what we have to understand is it's not only God's desire to save us, but it's also God's desires for us to live a life of freedom in him so that we can fulfill his purpose, his destiny, and his calling for our lives. Amen. He doesn't just want us saved. He wants us free indeed. If you believe it, put your hands together and give him praise. Now, the Bible is full of examples, and I could, I could give you many examples of, of what this looks like, but let me just give you one, because there's a whole group of people that are in this one example, all right? I think about the nation of Israel. I think about how this nation was in slavery for over 400 years, and then God, through his mighty hand, delivered them out of Egypt. He delivered them out of slavery. Uh, they came out of Egyptian bondage. But that group that came out of Egyptian bondage never walked in the promise of God and never fulfilled the destiny that God had for their life because even though they had come out of Egypt, Egypt was still in them. And they never fulfilled the purpose and, the, and they never received the promises that God had for their lives. And so there are many believers 
within the body of Christ that are the same way. They came out of Egypt. How many of you know that Egypt is a type of the world, right? It's a type of our old life, our old ways. We've come out of Egypt, but we've never really walked in true freedom because Egypt or the world is still in us. In other words, we've never fully surrendered everything to Jesus. We've never really committed everything to him. Oh, we know him as Savior. I'm not questioning your salvation today. But we really don't know him as being Lord in our life. Lord over every area in our life. In other words, God, I'm going to give you that, but I'm going to keep this. Lord, I've surrendered this to you, but I still have, I'm still holding on to this part of my life. How many of you know he's not Lord until he's Lord of everything? Come on, I said he's not Lord until he's Lord of everything, right? So here's a question I want you to write down. This is a question that you're going to need to answer, and I'm not expecting you to answer it today, but this is your homework for the week. What is your Egypt? What is your Egypt? I'll say it another way. What is still inside of you that's hindering you, that's keeping you, that's setting you back, that's keeping you from the promise of God and the purpose that God has for your life. Now, listen to me, church. If you don't identify this, and not only identify it, but deal with it, then I can, you are going to be drawn back to your old life and your old ways. Because if you don't deal with this, sooner or later, your appetite for Egypt is going to resurface. It's going to come back. All right? In other words, you're going to begin to miss Egypt. You're going to begin to miss those old things. Because whatever you feed the most in your life is going to be the strongest in your life. So if you're feeding flesh, the flesh is going to be the strongest. If you're feeding spirit, spirit is going to be the strongest. And that's what you're going to gravitate to. So if you neglect the basic principles of prayer, Bible reading, worship, fellowship, then you're going to begin to starve out the things of the spirit. And when you do that, the flesh is going to rise up and take dominion in your life. All right? You're going to begin to miss it. So when God first brought Israel out of Egypt, God supernaturally brought them out, and God supernaturally sustained them. I want to make a point with that. Now, by night, God led them, the Bible says, with a pillar of fire. So every time they looked around at night, they saw this flame. They saw this fire above them. It represented the presence of God. It represented the leading of God. And it represented that God had them. God covered them. And then in the day, the Bible says there was a cloud that covered them. So every time they looked up, there was this cloud representing the presence of God. That God is saying, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to protect you. Wouldn't that be awesome that every day you got up and you looked up and there's the fire of God and then there's the protection of God and there's the covering of God. Although we don't see it physically, spiritually it's there. How many of you know the fire of God is still there? How many of you know the presence of God is here? He lives on the inside of us. And God fed them supernaturally every single day of their life. They got up, they went outside, and there was fresh manna on the ground. It would appear supernaturally. I mean, they had so much manna. They learned how to cook manna every, every, every which way but loose. I mean, they had fried manna, they had boiled manna, they had baked uh, manna, they had banana manna, they had, they had gluten-free manna. It was like, where's that, where's that? I want to get in that line right there. Give me that gluten-free. I'm just trying to get you to see something. God supernaturally made provision, supernaturally signs and wonders. They saw it every day of their life. But yet there came a point in time where they said, we want to go back. We want to go back to Egypt. 
Because I've heard people say this, oh, if, I, if God would only just do this, if God would only show me this, or if I would just see God do this, or, you know, in other words, if God would just do this miracle for me, I would believe. No, you wouldn't. It'd wear off. It'd lift off of you. They saw it every day, and yet they had a desire to go back. It's not the miracles. It's not the signs. It's not the wonders. We praise God for it. Those things are not going to keep you. It is your commitment and your personal relationship with him that's going to sustain you in any season and any time of your life. Amen. God's more concerned about us and our relationship with him than anything else. So look at this scripture. This scripture, look at it, Exodus chapter 16, it says this. Then the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Told you they want to go back. They sat, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. How many of you know God's people have been complaining since the days of Moses? <laughs> this and that and this and that and that and the other. Complaining, God does this and they complain about that. He does that and they complain about that. And they're like, we would have been better off in Egypt. Because they started craving their former life. And I'm telling you, that you can come out and you can have a comeback, but if you don't start taking steps in, in the direction of discipleship with Christ, you're going to find yourself being pulled right back to what God brought you out of and what God delivered you from. Listen, I've seen it time and time again. Why is that? Because Egypt will feed your flesh. Egypt, the world is designed to feed your flesh. The world is designed to feed that fleshly appetite. The Bible tells us this. Look at 1 John 2, 16. So to what it says. For all that is in the world, Egypt, here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but where is it? It is from the world. Egypt is designed to draw you back, to pull you back through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It goes all the way back to the garden. It goes all the way back to the beginning. When God told Eve, he said, listen, all these trees are yours. You can take whichever one you want except for that one right there. That tree belongs to me. It was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat from that tree because God knew that when Eve ate from that tree, she would become sin conscious and she would destroy her innocence. Yet here comes the serpent. And what does the serpent say? Did God really say that? And what's God keeping from you? It's not that God's keeping anything from us. God's not keeping anything from us. He's keeping us from things that will harm us, right? And so the serpent deceives her and told her, look at the tree. It's good to eat. And he appealed to her flesh. He appealed to the pride of life, self-consciousness, self-centered. And then, then Eve also saw that the tree, the Bible says, was good for what? It was good for food, meaning that it looked like it would taste good and be satisfying and enjoyable. But the pleasures of sin are temporary. Eve fell to the lust of the flesh, trusting her feelings rather than trusting the word of God that was spoken to her. Eve also saw that the tree was delightful to the eyes. It was a beautiful creation God had made. Sin does not necessarily appear as ugly. It doesn't appear as dirty. And it doesn't appear as destructive. For Satan himself can disguise himself as an angel of light. 
So it doesn't look that way. It becomes destructive and it becomes ugly when we get ensnared in it and our lives become destroyed by it. Ooh, it's a little tighter in this second service, isn't it? Thank you. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these things all work against us to lead us astray and to pull us back. Here's what Israel forgot, and this is what many believers forget. They forgot the whips that their taskmasters whipped them with across their battered backs. They forgot that they about the bricks without the straw. They forgot about all of the forms of abuse that they endured while they were in Egypt. They forgot about all the pain and they forgot about all of the suffering. And sometimes when we get a little further down the road in our walk with Christ, sometimes we forget what God brought us from. We forget what God delivered us from. We look back and we're like, man, but we forget about the pain. We forget about the dysfunction. We forget about all the abuse. We forget about how we abused ourselves and we abused others. We forget about all of those things that God delivered us from, and we start craving to go back to that. What are we going back to? God has delivered us, and God has set us free. We should have no appetite for this world. Come on, church. We should have no desire for the things of God this world you got to remember where God brought you from what he delivered you from they forgot about all the stuff and they began to miss the meat they came out of Egypt but Egypt was still in them and you can come out of the world but if you don't get the world out of you you'll be drawn back to it so how do I come out of this bondage how do I get all in I'm going to give you the first step and there'll be many more after this, but let me give you the first step. Here it is. We're going to dive deep. Are you ready? Everybody lean in. We're going to dive deep. Here we go. Hi, Amber. How you doing? Okay, we're praying for you. You have to know that God loves you. Isn't that deep? <laughs> you have to know that God loves you. You and I will not live a fully surrendered life, all in life, if we don't get this one thing, if we don't understand that the Father loves us, that he loves us unconditionally, that he loves us without any strings attached. And this is hard for us as humans to understand, especially for those of us who are performance-driven. That would be me. Most men are. They're performance-driven because we get our identity by what we do. And even from when we were little boys, when mom or whoever would pat us on the head and say, that a boy, good job. It was performance driven. And so we take that mindset and we bring it into the culture of the kingdom and we bring it into the relationship that we have with the father and we think that the father's love is based upon what we do for him. God doesn't love me because I'm a preacher. God loves me because I'm his son. <laughs> Let me look at my live stream. Let me get some help out there. God doesn't love you because of what you do. God loves you because of who you are. You're his. You're his son. You're his daughter. It's not based upon anything that you do. It's based upon everything that he has done. And you have to get that settled in your heart. God loves you unconditionally. And I get it. I understand that's hard for some people. That's hard when, you know, maybe you grew up and you didn't get the kind of parenting that you really should have gotten. You didn't get the parenting that expressed that kind of love. Maybe you never heard that in your life, that, hey, you know, I love you, son. I love you, daughter, just because of who you are. Maybe the kind of love that you received was because of what you did or what you could do. Or maybe even worse yet, you never experienced that because the people in your life that were supposed to watch over you and, and nurture you and protect you were abusive to you. So it's then hard for you to understand that, that this God can love me just for who I am, that he loves me because I'm his. 
But I'm telling you, church, your spiritual growth and development will be hindered if you don't understand his love for you. Look at this scripture in John, uh, 1 John 3 and 1. He says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Who am I? I am a child of God. Who am I? I am a son of God. That's who I am. This is what I do, but who I am? I'm a child of God. And that is what we are. That's it. That's what we are. We are all children. And he says, I want you to look at this. He said, he said gaze on this thing. He said, look at this in wonder and amazement. John is telling us, hey, this isn't some warm, fuzzy, feel-good thing that you could actually visibly see the Father's love for us. And in case you're wondering, this is what it looks like. It looks like his son coming to this earth, taking our place, putting his sin upon, putting our sin, I should say, upon his sinless self and dying for us so that we can live again. That's what the Father's love looks like. If you want to see God's love, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus if you want to see God's love. That's how much he loves us, that he died for us, that he took our place. And this blessing doesn't come by nature. This blessing doesn't come by merit, so quit trying to earn it. This blessing comes but by the grace of God. It is by God's grace that you and I have been adopted. I know how we are. I know how we are. I understand there's somebody in this room because I get it. There's somebody in this room that's thinking, well, that's for everyone except me because there's always a loophole in this thing. I, God, that's for everybody else, but that's not me. Well, Paul addressed you. Here it is. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Paul's going to cover it for us. He says this, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Now, church, that's where you got to get. You've got to get to the place in your walk with Jesus that you are convinced of this one thing, that he loves you unconditionally, that no matter how much you mess up, and you will, and I do, no matter how much we mess up, he loves us. It is not, a, it's not conditional. It's not based upon what we do. It's based upon who he is. And listen, Paul said, I've come to the place where I'm convinced. No matter what happens in my life, I am convinced of this one thing. God loves me unconditionally. And if you want to grow spiritually, and if you want to develop into a champion of God, and if you want to be all in, you got to get that in your spirit. And you got to walk with that revelation every single day of your life. I'm convinced. And then he begins to talk about what? Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither present or future. How many of you know that covers a lot of territory? Nor any powers, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that pretty much covers it. I think that covers all of it. I think that anything else, <laughs> yeah, yeah, God couldn't love me because of, you put your anything else in there. And God said, I don't care what you put in that place. I don't care what you put in that place. It will not be able to separate my love for you. Nothing will be able to separate my love for you. You and I are his kids that's the way it is, adopted into his family, and he loves us unconditionally. Come on, let's give him praise and give him glory. First closing. First closing. For those of you that are new, it simply means what? There's two more. Who said four? I want to go back to the story I talked about last week. I want to go back to the prodigal son. And I want you to remember what happened there. 
um, he left his father, but this is what he found out. He found out that nothing else in the world could replace his father's love, nothing. Um, he had fortune. Remember when he said, give me my inheritance? His father was very wealthy. So he had, he had more money originally than he knew what to do with. So I don't care how many things, material things you possess or you go after, those things, fortune, cannot replace the Father's love. You'll still be empty and you'll still be void. He had fame. He was, he was popular for a while. And that's what the world tells us, for fortune and fame, fortune and fame, fortune and fame. That's all you need, fortune and fame. If you had fortune and fame, you'll be great and everything will be all right. He had fortune, he had fame, but everything wasn't all right. He had friends. All you need is a bunch of friends. He had friends. He lived this life where he did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it, as much as he wanted. That's the way he lived his life. But at the end of the day, none of those things, none of those things fulfilled the void that was in his heart. He still was empty. And let me, let me add this, none of these things separated him from the love of the Father either. None of them. None of that separated his, the Father's love from him. And he starts longing to go home. And it caused him to return home. And you can read this later when you go home this afternoon. When he started out on this journey, he said, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Sometimes it sounds like our prayer life. <laughs> give me, give me, give me. So when he comes home, he doesn't say, give me, give me, give me. You know what he says this time? He says, make me. Make me. I've tried this on my own, and I have failed miserably. Would you make me what I need to be? And he looked at the servants in his father's house, and he said, would you make me like one of your servants? And the father, the, really the father doesn't even address that question. He says, hey, bring, kill the fatted calf, bring the robe, get the, finger, get the ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. He ignores that whole question, but I, I had to go back to it because in my mind, he saw something in the servant that he lacked in his life. There was something that the servants in the father's house possessed that the son didn't have. And he said, I want, make me like one of them. Well, what would that be? I think it was the fact that they were fully surrendered to the father and were willing to serve at the father's request. I think, I think it is a mark of obedience. Obedience. Because here's the truth. We are sons and daughters of the most high God and we serve in his kingdom. We are sons and daughters. That's, that's our position. But we serve in his kingdom. To carry out what? His will and his purpose. Not my will, not my purpose, but his will and his purpose. Second closing, I promise. And I thought about, I thought about obedience and I thought about servanthood and all the people I could, I could bring as examples in the Bible of servanthood. It's an exhaustive list. And all of the qualities and characteristics of what servanthood looks like and and, and Jesus modeled it for us. He humbled himself and became a servant to all, right? Jesus said what? If you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to do what? You have to humble yourself and become a servant to all. But all the people that I could think of and all the people that, that I thought about 
who were great servants of the Lord. There's one that really caught my attention. I'm going to close with him. Okay, guys, come on, help me, help me close. Yeah, that's the, that's the cue for the praise team because I'll just keep talking all day. Look at Acts chapter 13. Remember a couple of weeks ago when I taught on worship and I talked about how that Saul was the people's choice? In other words, Saul was the choice of the flesh. God said, I'm your king. They kept crying, we want a king, we want a king. God says, I am your king. You're not like any other nation, I'm your king. And I rule through prophets and priests. And they said, no, we want a king. And he said, okay, I'm gonna give you. He gave them what their flesh wanted. Saul represents the flesh. I could say after the removal of the flesh, he made David their king. David was a king that God appointed, a king of the spirit. Watch this. God testified. Now, God is testifying about David. This is David's testimony. God's saying it. I have found David, a son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Here it is. He will do everything I want him to do. He will do everything I want him to do. And it's not that God wanted something done and David did it. It's not what it is. It's that special feeling that a father gets when he sees his son acting with the same heart he has. That's what God's looking for. And all in people have the heart of the Father and who are willing to serve and do whatever the Father asks them to do. I'm completely submitted to your will and your way and your purpose. And how many of you know that his will and his way and his purpose is far greater than anything that I could ever imagine for myself? You believe that this morning? Would you stand to your feet and give the Lord praise? Before I dismiss you, let me just say a few things. Number one, What is it that's in me that I know I need to deal with? What's in me that I need to deal with? Here's what I know, that if you'll spend some time in prayer, God will reveal it to you. You may already know it. And maybe you're like, Pastor, I don't know. If you'll spend some time in prayer, and it may not even be sin. I'm not, it may not even be anything that's sinful. But it may be God is saying, you know what? I want you to lay this down and I want you to pick this up. Will you be obedient to do it? So those are some things I want us to work on this week. I want us to work on this ideal of being all in, fully committed, fully surrendered, fully dedicated unto the Lord. In other words, God is first and foremost in everything in my life. He's first and foremost. Everything else comes after that. I'm going to put him first. I'm going to put him first. And watch and see what God will do. Watch and see what God will do. He'll take a little shepherd boy that nobody even noticed his own father didn't even recognize the gifting and the calling and the purpose that God had on his life his own father couldn't even see that his natural father and I'm telling you God can take you and take your life and do things that you never thought were possible that you never dreamed of and I'm telling you right here right now it's never too late just ask Abraham. Just ask Moses. It's never too late to get all in. Amen.
So, Father, we come to you this day and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you're giving us. Lord, you're looking, you're looking for sons and daughters who will fully surrender to you, who will fully surrender everything and yield everything to you. I just pray, God, as we move forward in this series and we move forward from this moment and this week, as you deal with our hearts, God, that we would surrender those things to you and pick up those things you're asking us to pick up. It's in Jesus' mighty name and awesome name that we pray. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. And everyone said amen and amen. Listen. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team's coming at this time. If you need prayer for anything, we want you to come and join us for prayer. Take some time to pray. Also, when you leave this building today, know that God loves you. I know it's very simple. I know it's very simple. But you got to get a revelation of that and never lose it. God loves you. God loves you. Amen. I love you. Have a great week. We'll see you right back here at the point or Saturday, 10 to 4. God bless you. We'll see you later. You can stay here and worship. If you need prayer for anything, I want you to come and join our prayer team. They'll pray with you. We'll see you right back here next week at the point. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree.